Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metropolis Radio. Today, we are looking at the Dick Tracy movie that was made with Warren Beatty back in 1990. Now, this movie was made and released right when Batman 89 was taking the world by storm. And Disney at this time was hoping that this movie would launch a franchise that could be their own Indiana Jones. And better yet, probably rival Warner Brothers with their Batman movies at the time. So the question on the table for this is, is this movie really that good? Or has it fell into the trap that most movies inspired by Batman 89 fall into, where they're just forgotten but discovered later over time? Or is this movie really not that good to begin with? Now before we get started, make sure to follow the blog, metropolisradio.blogspot.com, where you can stay up to date on all Metropolis Radio uploads, no matter if they're exclusive to YouTube, BitChute, Library, or whatever other platform you are currently watching this on. So with that out of the way, let's get right into Dick Tracy. So I figured with Dick Tracy being a legacy character, I want to start off this retrospective with talking about Dick Tracy's origins. Now, Dick Tracy started as a comic strip created by Charles Gould, and this character was actually inspired by the real-life Elliot Ness. Now, the comic strip became so popular that there was a radio show created for it. The radio show ran on all the major networks at the time that was NBC, CBS, and ABC from 1934 to 1948. Bob Berlin was the first guy to ever voice Dick Tracy on the radio show, and the actors would change out quite a few times over the course of over the course of the show's lifetime. Now, Dick Tracy's first comic book appearance came in 1936 in Dell's Popular Comics. Dick Tracy would remain a part of that publication until 1948. In 1948, Dick Tracy would get his own comic book, Dick Tracy Monthly, and that ran for 145 issues, and the first 24 would be published by Dell. All issues after that were printed by Harvey Comics, and Dick Tracy Monthly would run until 1961. Now, Dick Tracy was made into serials long before this movie came out, the first one being a 15-episode serial just called Dick Tracy that came out in 1937. Ralph Bird would be the first actor to portray Dick Tracy on the screen, and Ralph Bird would star in three more Dick Tracy serials. That was Dick Tracy Returns, Dick Tracy's G-Men, and Dick Tracy vs. Crime, Inc., now, in these serials, Dick Tracy is portrayed as an FBI agent instead of the detective that we know him as. And yes, there were also movies made long before Warren Beatty got involved with the iconic character. The first two, Dick Tracy and Dick Tracy vs. Cue Ball, came out in 1945 and 1946 respectively, starred Morgan Conway as the titular character. And Ralph Bird returned to the role for the last two movies that both released in 1947 called Dick Tracy's Dilemma and Dick Tracy Meets, Meets Gruesome. Now, speaking of Warren Beatty, he bought the rights to the character for movies and television back in 1985. He then optioned the movie to Disney and production started in 1988. Uh, now, there is more to the story to this thread, but I'm going to have to wait until later to really dive deeper into this. Now let's get into the creative team for this movie. Now this movie was directed by, by Warren Beatty. Now his directing credits include the movies Heaven Can Wait, Reds, Bullworth, a Dick Tracy TV special where Dick Tracy is interviewed by Leonard Maltin, and I'll get more into that by the end, so just wait for that, and his latest film, uh, Rules Don't Apply, that came out in 2016. And there were two writers on this movie, Jim Cash and Jack Epps Jr. They were a writing duo responsible for writing movies such as Top Gun, The Secret of My Success, Anaconda, Turner and Hooch, and The Flintstones in Viva Rock Vegas. Now let's move on to our character analysis portion of our retrospectives, and we'll start off with the man himself, Warren Beatty as Dick Tracy. Now he's the cop who doesn't want to get stuck behind the desk. His primary goal in this movie is to get Big Boy Caprice off the streets, and throughout this movie, other characters bring up the fact that they want him for police chief, but the police chief job comes with more paperwork and just more headache. And then we get Madonna as Breathless Mahoney. Ugh. It's Madonna, what more do I really need to say about that? But I'll go into it a little further, even though, despite the fact I don't like Madonna, she's the femme fatale of this movie. She's a singer at a nightclub. Tracy's trying to get her to testify against Big Boy Caprice, but she won't do it out of fear for her life. And at one point, she starts to fall for Dick romantically. And there is a part of her character that is tied to the plot, so we'll get into that in just a little bit when we get into the narrative analysis portion. Then we have Al Pacino himself as Big Boy Caprice, and he's the big mob boss of the town. He gets the club signed over to him by Paul Servino's character before he has him whacked off, 
And throughout the movie, he's trying to buy off Dick Tracy because he doesn't want him dead. Because if Dick Tracy turns up dead, he's the primary suspect. Uh, buying off Dick doesn't work, so he does try to whack him at one point, but it was made to look like an accident. Then we get to Glenn Headley as Tess Trueheart. Now, she's the love interest for Dick Tracy, and there's really nothing more to her than that, and that's fine. A hero needs to have a damsel in distress, and look no further than what this movie was based on, the original source material, the original Dick Tracy created in the 1930s. And finally, I want to touch on Dick Van Dyke as D.A. Fletcher. Now, he was the primary DA in this movie. He was bought off by Big Boy Caprice, and at some point in the movie, someone frames Dick Tracy for the murder of D.A. Fletcher, and that's really the only reason why I bring him up here is because he is essential to the plot of the movie. And the movie had a, had a very big cast for the time, a lot of A-listers, but I only focused on the characters that are absolutely vital to the story and plot of this movie. And this movie included other big-name actors such as Dustin Hoffman, I think he was Mumbler, uh, Charles Durning was the chief of police. Mandy Patinkin was 88 Keys, he, uh, the piano player. Uh, William Forsyth was a uh, flat top. That was Big Boy Caprice's uh, right hand man, his enforcement, if you will. And James Kahn. And James Kahn's character is not coming to the top of my top of my mind right now. Now let's get on to our narrative analysis portion of this retrospective. And this movie is set in 1930s New York. It follows Dick Tracy, who is a cop on the force. Uh, who looks to take down a mob boss known as Big Boy Caprice. And this movie really gets going by having Big Boy Caprice kidnap the club owner to force him to sign over the, the deed to the club before he kills him. Now, toward the beginning of the movie, there's a kid who steals someone's watch. Dick Tracy chases him and wants to capture him until he finds out that his father's really a POS. Now, Dick has to put him in the orphanage, but lets the kid stay with them until the social worker comes along. And then Big Boy Caprice takes over the club that Breathless Mahoney is uh, is singing at, and Dick vows to just take him down. Now, Big Boy Caprice doesn't want to kill Dick, because remember, he would be looked at as a prime suspect. So every time that Dick would have some witness or evidence against Big Boy Caprice, the DA would just magically drop everything, and business would just return to normal. Now, at one point, Dick Tracy bugs Big Boy Caprice's office at the club and starts busting up the various rings that Big Boy is running. And the logic is, if you can't get the guy behind bars, then the least you can do is hurt his bottom line. That's going to really get you noticed. Now, Big Boy sends out some of his men to get Dick to meet him in the base to meet him in a basement, and offers to buy out Dick to essentially look the other way. Dick doesn't go for it, and Big Boy tries to have him killed by staging it to look like an accident so the heat wouldn't be on him. We then get another villain thrown into the movie whose name is really not important. I can't even remember the name they gave him. But the villain is using 88 keys. That's uh, Mandy Patinkin's uh, character, the piano player, uh, from the club to carry out the work. The first thing that 88 has to do is take a ransom note to Big Boy to get him to pay a certain amount of money in ransom. This escalates to framing Dick Tracy for the murder of D.A. Fletcher and then ending it off with making it look like Big Boy Caprice kidnapped Tess so he would go away to a federal penitentiary. Now, the movie ends with Dick Tracy being sent off to a county jail, but the other cops let him come along to save Tess. Big Boy is forced into, into a position where he has to take Tess into a hostage because the club gets surrounded by all the cops. Then there's a fight between Dick and Big Boy, where Big Boy is trying to convince Dick that he's also being set up quite clearly. And this is where the faceless, nameless villain appears. The faceless villain tries to make a deal with Dick to kill Big Boy, but Big Boy grabs the gun and shoots the faceless villain. Dick then charges at Big Boy like a fucking bull and pushes him down a shaft where he presumably gets killed. Uh, then the faceless villain gets unmasked and it's revealed to be the one and only Breathless Mahoney. Now, I already gave this away in my character analysis portion because any film noir fan knows exactly what a femme fatale is. Uh, Breathless was trying to get rid of both Dick and Big Boy so that she could take over the town, basically with little to no resistance. Good idea, but they wisened up to it. And the movie ends with Dick Tracy looking to propose to Tess, but he gets called away for a robbery. He then throws her the ring box and just says, basically, without sounding too cliche, I'll be back. 
Now let's take a look at how this movie was received. Now this movie has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 61% based on 53 critic reviews and an audience score of 53% based on 77,251 audience reviews. Now this movie has a Metacritic score of 68 based on 24 critic reviews and as of the recording of this episode there is no user score. And this movie sits on IMDb at 6.1 out of 10 based on 56,364 reviews. Now this movie had an estimated budget of $47 million. So if we adjust that for inflation from 1990 to 2020, that is a budget of $92,704,353.48. And the movie grossed $162,738,726. But again, if we adjust the inflation from 1990 to 2020 numbers, that is a worldwide gross of $320,991,242.13. So basically, this movie was the equivalent of a $100 million blockbuster back in 1990. Now, this movie is not the most complicated for its genre. It's more of a crime movie than anything, but I would argue that you need to look at the source material that this movie is based on. It's not the most complicated story because it's based on a comic strip. The best parts about this movie feel like you're watching a live-action comic strip with the action, witty dialogue, and even the color palette. The movie is very colorful, but there's a reason to make this movie as colorful as it is... And this is where it vastly differs from Batman 89 with it being super, super dark. And I think it's important to also judge a comic book movie against its source material. If its source material was more pulpy and action-oriented and not too concerned about writing good dialogue, then if the movie brings that to the adaptation, then the movie is a very successful adaptation. Now, I'll end the episode off with this, and I want to end it off with, you know, why did this movie never get a sequel despite it being a box office success at the time, even if Disney wrote this off as a failure? Well, it had to do with the litigation surrounding this movie. Uh, Art Lindzen and Floyd Mutrux, the executive producers on the movie, sued Warren Beatty shortly after this movie released uh, because they alleged that they were owed a profit share of the movie's box office, and after that was settled... In 2002, Tribune Media tried to reacquire the rights back to Dick Tracy from Warren Beatty. Now, apparently, Tribune did not go through the process to reacquire the rights as it was stipulated in the original contract from 1985. Uh, Warren Beatty tried to sell the matter quickly, but Tribune basically said, no, we did everything right to reacquire the rights. And Warren Beatty at this time was asked about the sequel to Dick Tracy, and he said that he had a very good idea for it, but Tribune going about requiring the rights made the sequel, quote-unquote, commercially impossible to do. Uh, Disney, rejected tribu uh, Disney rejected Tribune's claim, even though they had no intention of producing a sequel. Now, this matter was brought to court by Warren Beatty in 05 when he sought $30 million in damages against Tribune and a declaration of the rights. Tribune believed that this matter would be resolved very quickly, so Tribune actually began development on a live-action Dick Tracy TV series with Lorenzo de Bonaventura, someone, a producer you all may have heard of, uh, Robert Neumeyer, and Outlaw Productions. And the TV show was going to have a contemporary setting very similar to, very similar to Smallville. Now, if the TV series had worked out, then they were saying a feature film could likely follow. Now, in August of 05, a federal judge ruled that would allow ba Beatty to sue Tribune. The April 2006 hearing ended essentially with no ruling, but in July of that same year, a Los Angeles judge ruled that the case could go to trial. Tribune tried to get the, ru the ruling in their favor, and their motion was rejected. Now, in 2008, Warren Beatty, being one hell of a crafty bastard, decided to make a Dick Tracy TV special for TCM with Leonard Maltin, where Warren Beatty would reprise the role of Dick Tracy as Leonard Maltin would ask Dick Tracy the questions, and one that came up was, will there ever be a sequel to Dick Tracy? Which Dick Tracy replied with, well, you're going to have to ask Warren Beatty about that. Now, by March of 2009, Tribune had, fi Tribune had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now, for those that don't know what Chapter 11 bankruptcy is, that's essentially just reorganization. Uh, the debt for the business will stop accruing, but the business still has to pay off that current debt, or the creditors could move in to basically take over their assets and close them if they want to. Now, that, that's exactly what happened to Toys R Us, by the way. 
But getting back to Dick Tracy, Tribune had tried to declare ownership of the Dick Tracy film and TV rights by stating that Mr. Beatty's conduct and wrongful claims have effectively locked away certain motion picture and television rights to the Dick Tracy property. Now, on March 25, 2011, a U.S. District Court judge granted Beatty's request for a summary judgment and ruled in Beatty's favor, quote, Beatty's commencement of principal photography of his television special on November 8, 2008 was sufficient for him to retain the Dick Tracy rights. Now, Warren Beatty immediately started talking about doing a sequel after the ruling, and the last anyone ever heard about it was 2016 at CinemaCon. Now, what ruined the potential of Warren, of Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy from becoming a franchise that could rival Warner Brothers' Batman franchise at the time to tie this back to the beginning? It was all the bullshit litigation. Maybe the executive producers had a legitimate claim. Maybe they were entitled to a profit share of the movie. But Tribune just wanted to absolutely railroad Beatty from ever doing the sequel from what I've read and basically just killed the Dick Tracy franchise entirely. <laughs> 